Old Brooklyn Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed old brooklyn christian church kept on jesus christ and this scripture outlines it a little bit because it says depart from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it if you haven't departed from evil you cannot do good and you cannot seek peace you cannot pursue it but when you depart from God when you make a wrong turn there is no peace outside of Jesus Christ and the devil may dress it up he may make it look like it's peace but it's not peace he may try to make people appear happy like they're having a the time in their life but they're living through a, a earthly hell amen it's just like in the book of Genesis even in the beginning when the enemy tricked Adam and Eve into partaking of the fruit he made it seem as if something that it was not amen and he does the same amen Romans chapter 3 verse 4 turn there with me and this is what I was just talking about it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. And this is what I was talking about because a lot of people make the wrong turn because they do not hold fast to this scripture. It says, let God be true, but every man a liar. What does it mean? Does it mean that everyone you see is just a pure liar? Because God did say liars, all liars, actually. He said they will have their part in the lake of fire. So does that mean that when my pastor is preaching to the congregation that every word he says is a lie? Is that what the word is saying? No, it is not saying that. But what it's saying is until God confirms it with you, it should be considered a lie. Until it lines up with the word of God that you have, that you possess, it should be considered a lie. A man should not be able to tell you something about the Bible or about God that God hasn't confirmed to you himself yet. And you just take it and believe it and run with it. Amen. But you should be working out your own salvation with fear and godly trembling amen so we need our own personal relationship with God in this day and age that we live in it's not common you have people they're dependent on priests you got people depending on priests to go on go to God for them on their behalf you got people depending on all type of things depending on the pastor you got people that's asking everybody to pray for them but they ain't pray for themselves ain't got on their knees one time but what we need is our own personal relationship with God. Amen. Because when we have our own personal relationship, no man, no devil, no demon in hell can come and just manipulate us and trick us and make us do things outside of the will of God. Why? Because we got God for our own selves. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 27. You have some people that believes that they're too far gone. I've heard that saying a lot. You have people that believe that God could not love a person like them. And I actually remember being there myself. If you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 27. <laughs> I remember being there myself to where you know, because I grew up in the church. So the Bible says in, in his word that if you do good or if you do bad, and I'm paraphrasing it. If you do bad, basically, if you do bad and you know it's bad, you will be beaten with many of stripes. But if you do bad and you don't know about it, you'll be beaten with few stripes. And that would always pound, pound in my head as I was growing up in the church, because even though I grew up with so much knowledge, I didn't do any of the things that I was being taught. Every time I would get away from my parents, and my family, I would just act a complete different way. 
And I started to self-condemn myself and I started feeling so guilty. And it got to the point where I didn't feel like I was worthy of God, which I wasn't, still aren't, still not. But I felt so unworthy of him that it made me want to just give up. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to serve God. I didn't want to do anything. And I believed that God would never love me again. I'm like, how could you love how could you love someone like me? I know your truth. I know what you say, do and don't do, and I still do it. I felt your love. This was after God had already touched me. This is after I had countless encounters with God. I knew who he was. I knew he was real. I wasn't just told it. I, I figured it out for myself. I even had my own relationship with him. And in spite of that, I found myself taking many steps back, and I didn't believe that God accepted me. I didn't believe that I belonged to God anymore, and I didn't think I could come back to him after all the things that I had done. But what I learned is through that experience is that a wrong turn, it doesn't destroy the path. It doesn't destroy the destination either. It just makes the path a little bit longer because <laughs> you took the wrong turn. It's like if you get off at the wrong stop, GPS going to add like 10 more minutes to your trip. And you just like, oh, boy. And it's frustrating. It's irritating. It's annoying. But you still end up at the same destination. Ezekiel chapter 18, 27, it says, again, when a wicked man turns from his wickedness, which he has committed and practices justice and righteousness, he will save his life. So a wrong turn does not destroy the path. It does not destroy the, de the destination because once you, be, or once you become born again, once you turn from your wicked ways and you practice justice and righteousness, it says that you will save your life. So just because you made a wrong turn, it doesn't mean that you have to or that you're condemned to that turn and you have to stay on that road. There's still hope. Yet, yeah, amen. And you have the devil lying to all types of people, telling them that they don't have no free will, that they're destined to hell. You have the devil filling people with lies, thinking that they're too far gone, that they did too much sin and all of these things. And the funniest thing, you have people that question whether or not they're a reprobate or not. If you are a reprobate, you're not going to question whether you're a reprobate. <laughs> you're not going to be you're not going to consider God. You're going to be so far gone that you, God is the last thing on your mind. You know you're going to hell and you can care less. That's what a reprobate is. And, but you have the devil tricking people, making them believe that because they took a wrong turn or because they took so many wrong turns that it's going to take too much to reach God. But it only takes one turn. You can make 20 wrong turns and it only takes one right turn to still get to the correct destination God set before us. Amen. Amen. And now is that time. Now is the time of repentance that even if I've made the wrong turn time and time again and I knew it was wrong, I still have breath in my lungs, meaning that I'm still able to turn. Pastor says this scripture a lot, and it really hit me the last time he said it. He always say that a dead, uh, a, uh, a dog is better than a dead lion in this scripture. And the reason he say that, is because as powerful as a lion if is, if it's dead, there's no use for it. But the dog still has potential because it's still alive. And basically what it's saying is if you are still alive, there's still hope for you to make the right turn. Amen. Revelation 18 and four, it says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. When I read this scripture and not even this countless other scriptures and when I've seen things in my own personal life, it really scared me about being around certain people because there's some people that really hate God. And they won't feel that they hate God themselves. They won't admit it. They won't say it. They don't even know they hate God. But with their actions constantly rejecting him, they hate God. It's a hard pill to swallow, but if you define it, it would be hatred. There's a lot of people that hate their kids. Why? The Bible says if you spare the rod, he who spares the rod hates their child. And you have people that do that and be, they don't feel that they hate their child. 
But by action, by display and in God's eyes and in God's word, they're hating them. And a lot of people do the same thing with God. And I don't want to be. Excuse me. I don't want to be around a person whose action says, God, I hate you. I can't afford to be around people that are God haters. I can't afford to be around people that that naysay all the time, that's doubting all the time. I can't afford to be around people that's complaining all the time. I can't afford to be around people that's always throwing a pity party. Why? Because I got the joy of the Lord ringing in my soul. In this scripture, it says to come out of her. It says that you be not partakers of her sin and you receive not of her plagues. Because if you hang around a person that's cursed, you're asking their cursings that I want to join. You're selling her cursings. I, I want some too. God, I know that I'm supposed to be called out. And I know that you say you're going to whoop this sinner. But I ain't got, I'm not done being whooped yet. I need some more. <laughs> Amen. That's what we do. When we keep ungodly fellowship, amen. But the Bible says to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. First Corinthians 6 and 9. It says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, neither or idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now this scripture, if I was a person that didn't know the word of God, and I saw this scripture, and then I looked at this world, I would be confused. I would be confu confused. When we were at the parade, the homosexual pride parade of people that celebrating two of the hugest sins <laughs> that came to be in one celebration, super scary. And, and you think that's the worst thing? No, you had pastors in the march with them, pastors of churches called churches of God, just perverting, throwing dirt all over God's name. And what it does is it causes confusion and it causes deception. I don't know what Bible they got. Maybe, maybe they wrote their own. Maybe they read the Bible and they made their own version of it. Because, you know, there's so many versions of the Bible Maybe they just created their own, like, you know, and they just changed all the words around and made it fit how they wanted to live. But the Bible says that effeminate, meaning homosexuals, and, and, it, and it doesn't say this just in the scripture. It's a whole lot of them. And actually God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of this reason. And in spite of that, you have people that believe that God loves them, whether they're homosexual or not. And they're deceived. They're deceived. You have people that believe that they're trapped, that they're a man trapped in a woman's body or, or vice versa. They're a woman trapped in a man's body. And they believe that they were born a woman inside. But outside they were born. What type of God would we serve to create something that confused that he creates you? One way on the inside, but the opposite on out. That, that, that's not how God works. When he created man, as I like to say, and I said it in one of the uh, events me and Brother Matt was at, that God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but that's not the only thing that's listed in the scripture. All of these things are listed as sins. And it says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the deception comes because people believe that they can do whatever they want and still enter into the straight gate. If that was the case, it wouldn't have said that narrow is the gate and few be there that, that find it. Amen. It wouldn't have said broad is the, the road to destruction and many be that go enter therein. It wouldn't have said that. But you have people that believe they can do whatever they want. And what they do is they pervert the grace of God. And I hate, I don't like to use the word hate, but I hate that. I hate that people take God's grace and they pervert it and make it as an excuse for sin. 
That's like, that's, I don't even, I, that might be blasphemy. I, I don't know what to call that. That's the most wicked. I believe that's more wicked than witchcraft. Amen. That's more wicked to me than talking to the dead. That's more wicked than me to me than anything you could possibly do is take the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, dying for our sins, bearing pain that none of us would be able to even live through and breathe through. And he, he, not only the pain physically, but the pain of all the sins weighing down on him, taking our sins to the grave, rising up, leaving us behind the comforter, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. And they take all of that as an excuse to say, I can sin because Jesus already died for my sins. But what's so retarded about it is that even after Jesus Christ died and all of this stuff, the Bible still says to repent. So I, I don't know. Maybe they removed repent out of the rest of the Bible and they made their own version <laughs> and they created it. Just remove repent. It still says to repent after and before Jesus Christ came to this earth. Amen. So I don't understand where people get their doctrine from. But we need to warn those that's on the wrong path. Amen. Because there's many people that's deceived. And it's easy. If you don't have your own relationship with God, how can you not be deceived? How can you not fall? The Bible says even Satan himself transforms as an angel of light. Amen. How will you not be deceived if you don't know the real true and living God? Matthew chapter 23, starting at the first verse, and I'm almost finished here. You got one more scripture after this one. That's Matthew chapter 23. Starting at the first verse, it reads, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, they do it to be seen of men. They make broad their uh, phylactes phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, but, but be not ye called Rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. Nobody want to be that. It says, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exhausted. Amen. That scripture says a mouthful. So the scripture is outlining uh, the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites because they're teaching things and they're not even doing them themselves. And they love to do duties to be seen of men. Now, check this out, because I, I've learned that a lot of times Jesus called them out, called them straight hypocrites, was not scared to say it, didn't care. <laughs> straight called them hypocrites. And all the all the time that they were following him and trying to accuse him and all of these things, everything that they did was to be seen of men. But Jesus said that they don't do the things that they're teaching, meaning when they go behind closed doors, they're not doing what they're preaching. They're just preaching these things to be seen of men. That's why they love being in the uttermost parts and all of these things. And you have religions nowadays, false religions, false doctrines. And if you pay attention, every false religion, if you pay attention to the people that follow that religion, none of them serve their God the way that they're supposed to in their false doctrine. They don't serve their God the way that they're supposed to. What they do is they put on a front for people. 
Every false religion you have, you have a bunch of them. And it's not even just false religions, even Christianity, even our, what we believe. You have a lot of people, they put on a show for people, but they don't actually do the works that they're protesting to people. Amen. But you have it mostly in false religions. They're, they're like famous for that. They, they, they look holy. They appear holy. But if you spend some time with them behind closed doors, you will learn how unholy they are. And I'd said before that it is our job to warn those people that are on the wrong path. But also, I will say that we don't have the duty nor the power to change anyone's path. So no matter how much warning we do, no matter what we do, we don't have the power to change one's path. We don't have the power to turn someone's life around and direct them towards God. We don't have the ability and thanks, praise be to God that we don't have the duty either. God did not give us that duty to change people's path. But what we do have the power to do and what we do have a duty to do is influence people's paths. Amen. Not to change their path for them, not to force them to walk a path, but we have the power to be a holy influence on someone's life. How do we influence them? Is it by hours of correction? Is it by hours of trying to beg them to follow God? Is it trying to manipulate them and trick them into doing it? Do we have to bribe people to follow God? Say, so if you come to church, I'll give you $200. Everybody will be in the seats. We wouldn't be able to sit down. I wouldn't be able to sit in the pulpit. No. We influence people's path by walk, simply walking our path, by simply making the right turn. Everyone that is making the wrong turn are going to be influenced. Why? Well, I remember being in school and I kept talking about church and everybody would make fun of me about going to the church. And in spite of all of the uh, laughter and the ridicule of people making fun of me and playing around, you would always have at least one person that's sincerely interested of me going to church. And I wouldn't even know until they come up to me and start asking me questions. And they'd be like, well, how do you pray to God? All of these things. And I would wonder, like, wh why? Why do you want to know? Why are you asking me about God? You know, these people was all laughing at me. And the reason why is because I was simply making the right turn while everyone else is making a wrong turn. Think about what message that sends. Everyone is, is making fun of you for doing something, and you're the only one doing it. If it's me, I'm going to wonder, what, what is wrong with you? Why is it that you follow after this so hard, so passionately, while everyone else is doing the opposite, everyone else is making fun of you? How has this thing been so good to you that you're still sticking with it with all of the ridicule? And I can imagine that that's the way people looked at Jesus, that they were mocking him, calling him king of the Jews, saying, oh, you can save other people, but yourself you can't save, and, and spitting on him and, and hitting him in his face and giving him vinegar to drink for water. And I can imagine as them, as they ridiculed Jesus and did all of these horrible things to them, I can imagine people were thinking, what is it, Jesus? What is it that makes you go through all of this suffering willfully? Why haven't you turned your back? Why haven't you given up on this path? Why Jesus, after all of this pain, why didn't you just call down a legion of angels to wipe them completely out? Why? Because he knew what the result was going to be. And he knew that what he was doing was worth it. And do you feel the same way? Do you feel like making the right turn is worth it? Because if you feel like if you make the wrong turn, it's not gonna make a difference, you're never gonna make the right turn. As long as you ponder in your mind and you think, man, what, what if I follow God? And I used to think this myself as a younger person. I would think, what if I do all of this and I go to church my whole life, I do what's right and I don't sin, and then I found out there's no heaven, no hell. And they were like, man, that would be like, <laughs> that would be exhausting for no reason. And then God had to reveal himself to me. And I found out that a lot of people feel this way and this is why they don't go the right way because they feel that there's no benefit. They feel that there's no purpose and that there's no reason. Nothing is gonna happen, you're just gonna die. But woe unto them because God said he's coming back, amen? And he's not coming back with water again, he's coming back with fire, amen? And I believe, I haven't experienced it, but I think fire hurts more than water. 
You know, I would rather, I, I'm, I have a huge phobia of drowning. That's my worst fear, heights and drowning. You put me in a deep pool and I can't feel the bottom of the pool with my feet, I'm drowning because I'm going to panic, I'm going to go crazy and move all around, waste all of my breath, and I'm going to start to sink. But in spite of my phobia of drowning, since I was tiny, I would rather drown than be burned alive. I, mean, I would rather, I, I believe it would hurt a lot worse than drowning, amen. But that's the way God is coming back. And whether you believe it or not, it's recorded already that every knee one day will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. My last scripture I wanna leave with you is 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. And it says, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. The Bible says also, be ye holy as I am holy. It says in another scripture, be ye therefore perfect even as I am perfect. And he did use that in a certain context, but he did tell us to be holy. And he did command us to live a life free from sin. He don't want us to be servants of sin. And a lot of times you can look at this and think it's impossible. How do you do that? How is that possible? Man, your, your thoughts are all over the place. How do you just not sin? And it's not, I've learned, and it's not because I've just been living without sin and I'm so holy. It's, it's a simple answer. The, the answer is not as complicated as people make it. The answer is all over the Bible plenty of times. And this is one of them. And it, it, it's, it's all the same thing, but this is one part that it says it. It says to seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face continually. And you, it is impossible, impossible to avoid, avoid making a wrong turn if you're not seeking God continually because a lot of people will seek God and then they make one right turn they make the right turn not one they make the right turn it's only one way to Christ amen they make the right turn and they feel they feel good about it and, and all of that good stuff and then they find themselves still making the wrong turn time and time again starting all over straddling the fence going back and forth and you got to wonder why is that it's because people are no longer seeking God's face look in the Bible People that lived a sin-free life, people that lived that God raved on about and said there's none like them in all the earth, all of these, these people seek God's face non-stop. So if you want to know the answer of how do you live a holy life, how do you continue in God's word, how do you not fall back into sin, it's not science, it doesn't take a theology degree, it's simple, seek God's face continually. Because if, you see, if you're seeking God's face, you give the devil no room. That's what he says by give no room, give no place to the devil. When we stop seeking God's face, we leave room for the devil to creep in. Because when we stop seeking God's face, see when we seek God, we're inviting him. We're inviting more of him into us, into our hearts, into our mind, into our spirit into our walk, into our talk, into every aspect of life, we're allowing God in, even our job, even the people around us. When we seek God, we're allowing him in. And when we stop seeking him, it's almost as if we're pushing him out and we're allowing the devil to come in. And if you ask yourself, if you wonder why is it you keep falling back into sin, it's because you stopped seeking God's face. And this is why he said men are to pray, always pray, and never cease, never faint, amen? And this is why it says continually. It didn't say seek his face one time, seek his face most of your life, seek his face. It says seek it continually, amen? Old Brooklyn Christian Church, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover.